We're going to continue our discussion of information retrieval and talk about ranked retrieval, particularly ranked retrieval using a technique called TF-IDF. The basic idea behind ranked retrieval is that we're going to have some function that takes the user's query and the documents and then allows you to compute a score for every document compared to the query and how good does the computer think that it is at answering that query. As a result, instead of just a mass of documents that come back to the user and potentially overwhelms them, we're now going to be able to present a sorted list to the user, and the user can look at search result number one, see if that looks any good. Look at search result number two, see if that looks any good. Then go to search result number three, and hopefully, if the ranking function has done a good job, they'll be able to find the document that answers their question more quickly and then stop and even if there are 20,000 results, if they can only go through the top n, and that n is relatively small, they'll still be happy. Mathematically, the way that we're going to do this is we're going to create vectors that encode both the query and the document. And then we can just take the similarity of these two vectors as a proxy for the relevance. So let's focus a little bit more on this, because this is going to be a very common theme for the rest of this course, using vector representations of words, documents, and sentences. We'll be seeing this again and again. This is the first time that we're seeing it, so let's dwell a little bit on this because it's going to be super important. In information retrieval, we need to represent both queries and documents with a vector to compute relevance. But this problem comes up again and again. We want to know if car is more similar to automobile than car is similar to rutabaga. And to answer these sorts of questions, we need to have computational representations of words. We'll also want to do things like, is the sentence, it's going to rain today, similar to the sentence, there's going to be precipitation this morning. And to answer these sorts of questions, we need to have computational representations that reflect the meaning of words, sentences, or in the case of information retrieval, documents. Modern natural language processing uses vectors to try to answer all of these questions. We're going to use vector representations for documents, for sentences, for words. Let me just say right off the bat that this representation is wrong. It doesn't do everything that a human could do, but computers can do a lot with these vector-based representations. And at the moment, it's the best that we've got, and it works relatively well. It works better than everything else that we've tried. And one of the things that we'll look at in this class is how to critically think about what vector representations are useful, what are the limitations of vector representations. But vector representations have given us a lot of power thus far. And historically, one of the most important, one of the most groundbreaking places where vector representations were first used was in information retrieval and the innovation that Karen Spark Jones had in using these vector-based representations, using formalisms like TF-IDF, really revolutionized the way that humans and computers work with each other to access information. And this innovation of using vector-based representations of words, documents, and sentences carries on till today and has had a renaissance in the last couple of years. So this will be a big theme that we see throughout this entire course. We'll see this theme again and again, and we'll see it in a number of different iterations. And in each case, we'll talk about the theory behind vector representation that we're talking about at that particular moment. We'll talk about where it's useful to use that vector representation, and how these vector representations connect with each other. Let's get back to information retrieval. Information retrieval uses vector representations of documents. And in this vector representation, each dimension of the vector corresponds to some word. And we're going to represent each document as a point in this vector space. And if documents share a bunch of words, they'll be considered similar. And if a query shares words with the document, they'll be considered similar. So in this drawing here, document 1 and document 2 are relatively close to each other, there's a smaller angle between them, then say document 3 and document 4, they have a much larger angle between them. And so this is how we'll compare the similarity of documents in this vector-based representation. So 
the details that I haven't told you yet are how do we compute the values for each of the dimensions and recall that each dimension corresponds to a word and how do we compute this angle between two vector representations of a document or a vector representation of a query. Before we answer those questions, I just want to say up front that this is going to be a very high dimensional space. So one of the few laws that we have in natural language processing is something called Heap's Law. And this basically says that the size of the vocabulary of a language grows according to the number of documents raised to some power b multiplied by a constant k. And these are constants that are specific to the types of documents that you're looking at and the language that you're looking at. So English has fewer words than a language like Turkish, and tweets have fewer words than Wikipedia articles. But for, say, a news corpus, on English, k is going to be something like 44 and b is going to be something like a half. So the size of the, your vocabulary is going to grow exponentially with the number of documents that you have. And when you're looking at something like, say, the internet or Wikipedia, these huge document collections, you're going to have a huge, huge vocabulary and thus a very high dimensional vector space. Now, the good news is that most documents won't have every word, so these will be sparse vectors, and there are computational tricks you can do to save memory, but underlying the engineering tricks that you do, these vectors are going to have a very, very high dimensionality. Okay, so now let's talk about how we would actually encode the dimensions of these vectors. And so there are two high-level intuitions that we want to capture. The first intuition that we want to capture is that if a word appears a lot in a document, it's probably going to be important to that document. And so if you have a document that mentions Russia a lot, this document is probably about Russia. And so if your query comes in with the word Russia and you have a document that mentions Russia 50 times, then maybe this document is relevant to that query. But not all words are equally useful. And the will appear in just about every document, and it will appear a lot. Words like the, of, yesterday, today will appear in tons of documents, but they're not going to be all that useful for answering the query that the user is putting in. So how do you get rid of words that appear in lots and lots of documents that probably aren't all that relevant to your queries? You can use the document frequency. And so uh, we've been talking about TF-IDF and I haven't said what that is yet, so now we can explain what that is. So TF-IDF refers to term frequency and inverse document frequency. The term frequency captures how often an individual word appears in a document. And the inverse document frequency accounts for how many documents the word appears in. So if a word appears a lot in a given document, it's probably important. But if a word appears in many documents, it's probably not so important or useful. And so if you combine those two things together, that turns out to be a pretty good way of capturing how important a word is. So let's turn that intuition into an equation. So we're going to compute the TF-IDF score of an individual word I in document J. And we're going to do that by combining two things together. We're going to see what is the frequency of that word in this document. So, take the number of times the word appears in the document, take the total number of words in the document, divide one by the other, and then you get the term frequency. Then, take the total number of documents in your collection, and divide that by the number of times this word appeared in any document. So, the number of times this word appears in any document in your collection. Then you're going to take the log of that and multiply that by the term frequency, and you'll get the TF-IDF score for that word. So this now becomes your vector representation of both search queries and documents. While there aren't many laws in natural language processing, we're lucky in that we get to talk about two today. Ziff's law captures how many useful words there are for doing things like information retrieval. 
And the short version of the story is that there are a lot of useful words. The frequency of a word is inversely proportional to the rank frequency of the word. So like if you take all the words in a vocabulary and you start with the and then you go down to the least frequent word and you just order them like that and for any given word you can see where it lands in the ranking and so the is number one, of is number two, and so on and then you scale that by some constant. This does a really good job of capturing how frequent the word is. And if you actually plot what this looks like for many different languages you get a very nice pattern and a consistent long tail of words. And the moral of the story is that you're going to have tons and tons of words that appear just a little bit. And you're going to have a small number of words that are very, very frequent, but most of the words that are interesting and useful don't appear all that often, and there are lots of them. So, to do anything useful, you're going to have to deal with this very high dimensional space in TFIDF vector representations. Okay, so we've talked about how you fill out these vectors. How do you compare these vectors once they've been filled out? So, because they're vectors, we can do things like take the cosine similarity or the dot product to compare how similar they are. In practice, we want to do the latter, however. If we normalize all the vectors so that they're unit length, then we don't have to do as much work for the cosine similarity as for the dot product. And in the dot product, we just multiply all of the entries in the vector together, and that gives us the answer. So we're going to favor dot products to compute the similarity between vectors. And this is equivalent to the cosine similarity, computing the angle explicitly, if the vectors are all normalized. So we'll see examples of this in class, and you'll get better intuitions about this. This will also be part of a homework assignment. So to wrap up, we've talked about how we can find ranked listings for information retrieval systems using TFIDF vector representations of documents. And this is not just for documents. Throughout this course, we're going to see vector representations of just about everything and we'll see ways of getting around the problems that come up from Heap's Law and Ziff's Law as we find more compact representations of words and documents. Nevertheless, the techniques that we talked about today form the foundation of a lot of the representation learning that we'll be doing in later portions of this class, and information retrieval systems are vitally important for downstream tasks like question answering, as we'll see later on in the course. So this is a good place to start. It gives you a, an intuition for the sorts of things that we'll be using, and despite the complexity of these very high-dimensional vectors, a lot of the intuitions that you develop here will be useful later on.